It's time to simplify grain marketing and the markets. That's what we're talking about in this episode of the Business of Agriculture. Hey, Damian Mason here with a question before we hop into this episode of the Business of Agriculture. If you farm for a living, you employ a lot of amazing technology from your inputs that you put into the soil to the tractor that you sit in, your combine, the amazing data that it harvests. But has your soil analytics kept up technologically with everything else in your farming operation? I would venture to say that no, it is not. Sure, you check for your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your potassium, your micronutrients as well. But what about disease pressure? Do you know what diseases and what pests you're going to face next year? No, you don't. But you can now figure that out with Pattern Ag's predictive analytics. Think about it. They can tell you now with testing what the likelihood of facing nasty diseases, things like cyst nematode or uh, sudden death syndrome, what the likelihood of you having this in your field, then you know how to prepare, how to treat, and where to invest your money. It's using technology to make you bigger yields and therefore make you bigger money. Go to www.pattern.ag to learn more. They are pioneering the way in predictive agronomy. Hey there, welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. Got a great show for you today because I've got a guy that I just described as a man with forceful convictions. His name is Joe Vaklovic. His company is Standard Grain. He and I visited 13 months ago and uh, with Shea Folk and talked about uh, some some issues in the commodity markets, etc. He's a former commodity marketing guy. He certainly knows his way around the CME. Now he essentially is an advisor. He creates content. He, if you haven't, if you haven't kept up with him, you should. He's all about uh, being entrepreneurial. He's all about providing something of value. And he himself says, you know, I am a trader, but I, I don't really do that anymore. And we, we, we got into this because I said, uh, what's a topic that you think we should cover? Because you've got good stuff. And he said, why don't we talk about simplifying the grain markets and marketing? I said, I love that. If you listen to this episode or this show before, you've heard me say, I have a degree in agricultural economics from what's allegedly one of the top five ag schools in the country. I would not be comfortable marketing my own grain. This is not my thing. I never really liked it, but I also don't fully understand it. And some people that tell you they do, I think are full of shit. Joe, why is it so complex? A um, couple things. I, full disclosure, I, I do still do a little bit of brokerage business. That's not what I hang my hat on anymore. Uh, I went to a similar school and I have a similar degree and... Um, I learned very, very little of what I actually know in, in school. We, you learn things on the job, as as we both know. Well, that, that's exactly right. And so it, it used to be this thing that they grabbed some 22-year-old kid fresh out of a land-grant school that uh, has a degree in agricultural economics, and they like throw him on the floor, throw him in the room, whatever. And I, I never understood what the hell happened there. And I'm not well, sure. That's pretty, much, that's pretty much how I got into this. So, yeah. That's so exactly. take me back there. Take me back there. You're 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 fresh out of you know a, a freshly minted uh, get out of an ag school, and then what? Yeah, I went to school in Champaign, and um, I went to work at the Board of Trade when I was 21, and uh, start making phone calls. And um, you acquire a book of brokerage business, and uh, since I had an ag degree, uh, I figured my my thing's going to be ag and grain marketing, right? Um, so I did that for years and, and I still do a little bit of it for uh, the customers that I think need it. But um, the the longer I did it, the the more that I realized I had more to offer than brokerage services. As I came to understand the markets, how the markets work, how people market grain, my my thought was that I could help people in a different way. And that's why that's why I got into the content business, into the essentially advisoring, advisory business, if you want to call it that. Uh, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, we podcast, we do YouTube, we do a paid newsletter, and then we do paid videos where we try to essentially walk farmers through the markets and explain um, how things work the way that they work, why they work that way, how to simplify. We talk about a lot of the concepts that I'm going to talk about here, and uh, it's it's worked out well for me. It's it's been uh, um, a good business model, but it's also been uh, just something that I feel a hell of a lot better about than I ever did when I did a brokerage business exclusively. So dialing for dollars, your first job, uh, you see, you're younger than me. It used to be like they gave you a phone book. Uh, so it was a little more advanced than that, I'm sure, 18, 19 years ago when they did this. But you, you said, they said, go get some clients to take money from yeah. and help them trade stuff. What I did was I I traveled a ton. So, I mean, I went to every trade show and, and I spoke everywhere that I could and um, uh, just did a lot of that to, 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 you know, what we would call generate leads, which, um, you know, I never had 
a bad intention in doing it. My intention was to help. It's just that after I did that exclusively for 15 years, I I came to the realization and, and it took this this happened over the course of years. I came to the realization that I've got more to offer. There's a different way to do it. Quite honestly, making money the way that I'm making money now doing content is a hell of a lot harder than it ever was doing brokerage, but I sleep a lot better at night. My wife says, by the way, she says, you know, you used to cover 9,500 political comedy gigs a year uh, back in the old days and be gone almost 200 days a year. She says, but I think you work harder now doing less speaking engagements, but all the other stuff that you do. Uh, and I sleep well also because it's like, it's like, it's a fulfilling uh, content. Uh, the content business is a bitch. I mean, this is, this is the real deal. You got to be, you got to be fully invested if you want it to work. And uh, I, I, fully dove into it four or five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, yeah, that, I appreciate you saying that. This is uh, uh, starting my eighth year of the business of agriculture show. So yep. I appreciate you being on. Anyway, the, the grain markets are complex and, you know, the thing worked really well. What was it? A hundred plus years ago, we set up this thing called the Chicago Board of Trade. We basically standardized, commoditized stuff so that we knew what the hell we were selling. So it, it created a marketplace that everyone could uh, understand the products. Number two, yellow corn, uh, 30, you know, standardize the weight, a 34 pound bushel of oats, um, all those kinds of things, ratings and gradings, and then commoditization. It was good so that then there could be a marketplace and an, an understandable product. Uh, then, then what? <laughs> that part all you can get into. It's like, absolutely, this is good. It's kind of like understanding a currency, you know what I mean? Or like when we standardize what a, a, a 12 inch foot versus the whatever the king of the era said a foot is, or, you know, when we standardize currency, what is a dollar uh, versus just we got some nuggets of uh, gold that could be, you know, gypsum, whatever. The part about the standardization, commoditization, et cetera, et cetera, is all good. The complexity, though, when you are a producer of this stuff, you know, I listen to the markets. I, I drive around, listen to the ag radio, and I'm still a little bit like, what the hell? What does that mean? What do they just talk about? It's it is pretty complex, even for us that are in the business. Way overcomplicated. Um, so I, I'll start. I'll start this with an analogy, I guess. So I I taped a video uh, this week, as a matter of fact, with a guy named Mike Finley, and Mike Finley um, is a financial teacher. I guess I would call him he's not a financial advisor, but but he came on and talked about. Uh, investing in the stock market in particular and how like essentially 99% of the products that Wall Street offers to the investor are are not necessary. 99% of the products that Wall Street throws out for the average investor are useful only to those selling the products. They generate fees and, and make money for those who create it and sell the products. They're not the best thing for the consumer. I think that grain marketing and, and the business, the way that what it's become is something along those lines. There are so many products and things out there that are just not necessary for you to be a good grain marketer that you're sold, you know, every single year. And, and, and they come from a million different directions. I mean, everybody's got something to do with grain marketing right now, whether it's the grain buyer or brokers or somebody selling something. I mean, everybody's trying to get their hands in this grain marketing thing. And it's just like most of it's not necessary. Okay. You're talking about like uh, products that I can buy if I'm a producer um to to you know the idea is protecting margin right and and, and so you're saying i don't need okay them. here's 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 how you summarize it I wrote, I wrote all this down for you okay there are there are three things that you need and then i wrote down about 12 things that you don't need you want to hear the three things you need three things you need and 12 things you don't need i like it this is in order the first thing you need to do is figure out your budgets what does it cost you to grow corn soybeans wheat whatever that's the first thing you got to figure out you need some sort of spreadsheet budgeting program. Um, our mutual friend, Chris Barron and Shay, they've got the best one that I'm aware of. But there's a lot of other good ones too. Um, the second thing would be crop insurance. Understand your crop insurance situation. Understand that you are able to sell once the crop is planted up to your insurance guarantee without penalty. And then the third, th third thing is understand cash sales, understand HTAs. Those are the only three things that you need. Um, I need the a budget. I need to know my cost of production. We've been hearing this since I probably, you know, the first ag that's meeting. Step, right? That's step one. Yep. Uh, crop insurance, which, by the way, one of the few industries in the world, maybe the only one, where the United States federal government will pay for part of your, for an insurance policy that guarantees you revenue enough to break even. Uh, 
they guarantee you a, a certain price that's calculated. But yeah, I mean, they, they subsidize insurance for you and, and everybody buys it. Everybody has it, but I don't know if everybody understands it. Too. Everybody, what is it? 93% of the acres or something are, are insured now. Vast, 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 vast majority. Yes. What was the third thing, Joe? Crop insurance. Then you said the HT. I would let, let cash that. sales. Cash sales. And uh, one way to make cash sales is is through what we call an HTA, which is something you do with your grain buyer. And it's, 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 it's edge to arrive or futures only. So you lock up the futures and bases separately. You could honestly probably throw that out and just stick with cash sales. But separating futures and bases is 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 best practiced in, so in, the three in my things I need The three things that I need as a producer is I need to know my cost of production. I need to make sure I understand and utilize crop insurance. And then the third yes. thing is understanding cash, meaning... I can go ahead and uh, and like right now, here it is, we're recording this in December of 23. I can go ahead and say, I know I'm going to be peeling soybeans off. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and sell up to 40 bushels uh, per acre uh, at these prices for uh, the October delivery. Yeah. Okay. Those are the three things I do need to understand and do. And the crop insurance thing is one that is not understood very well. Um, I had, a, a, there's a vi- there was a premium video I did with uh with steve johnson who used to be at iowa state he's like he's like the crop insurance guy that, that we talked to and he's excellent and uh the, the big take home from the video is this is guys if you bought the crop insurance once the crop is planted you can sell up to your insurance guarantee without penalty even if you don't grow the bushels and in a year like this last year in particular where we had a drought in june people were really afraid to sell when the crop when the market was at its best yeah that's when understanding crop insurance really really comes into play Basically, like we didn't get any rain in June and mm-hmm. say, man, the price is looking good, but I'm not sure there's going to be a crop. You say, go ahead and sell. You've got mm-hmm. insurance. Go ahead and go ahead and sell yep. the bushels, even if you don't think you're going to have them because the insurance will cover it, right? Yeah. And people wanted to murder me over the summer when I was talking when I was talking about this stuff. I mean, um, when when I was when we were talking about crop insurance and how you can sell into rallies and how um you know, crop scare events are, are very often your best marketing opportunities. I mean, I got a lot of shit from people about that. I did, but you need to understand people. It's, I don't know. I think people understand it. I think it's just a mental thing. Like, and that's, that's why um, me not, you mentioned before we started, you said, Joe, you don't have any ag stuff in your background. I'm like, I'm not a farmer I didn't grow up on a farm. I'm a city boy, but it's good that I'm not a farmer. And it's good that I don't grow, live in the corn belt because I look at the numbers. I don't, I don't look at the crop. It doesn't, doesn't matter to me. Yeah, that's that's by the way, it's very. Uh, what is it like the 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 you know, pretty woman, the prostitute? She she wouldn't kiss her clients because it was too personal. You've got a similar kind of a concept there. You don't want to make it too personal. I've got a video on YouTube about why I don't live in the corn belt. It's like it would drive me nuts looking at crops every day. Couldn't do it. All right, so I want to hear more about the ten or twelve things that I don't need. Before I do that, uh, dear listener, I want to tell you about my new sponsor, Redox Bionutrients. Redox is a family business with products for agriculture and turf that are increasingly applied to more and more acres in the United States and even internationally. With 30 years of proven infield success, Redox is helping farmers shift from traditional fertilizers to highly efficient carbon-based technology. Redox Bionutrients has been around for 30 years, folks. This is not some new, uh, you, you know, new biological company with a bunch of venture capital money. They've actually got products that work because they've been doing it for 30 years. Redox Bionutrients provides superior nutrition, abiotic stress defense, root growth, soil health, and efficient nutrient uptake. You can check out all their products at RedoxGrows.com. Redox, R-E-D-O-X, RedoxGrows.com. While you're there, check out the Redox Grows podcast. I was recently a guest on there. That's Redox Foxgrows.com. Uh, one of the, the three things I do need, I think those are very, very solid. Um, there's a dozen things that you said you wrote down that I don't need as a producer. And I'm uh, guessing, and this, you talk about people giving you a hard time. I'm guessing that people within the industry give you a hard time because you're a little bit on the edge. You're a little bit of an outlier. You're the one that's kind of like calling bullshit on some of the things that they are out there making money selling. I honestly don't think anybody cares what I do, to be honest. But um, <laughs> I, I do have a, and these are not things that, Okay, so some of the some of the the things on this list are bad. Some of them are are good if done right. None of them are are necessary to be a good grain marketer. Does that make okay. sense? So they're they're not intrinsically bad. It's just that not all of them. Some of them are intrinsically bad. So, but not all of them. Okay, the first one I wrote down is futures and options. You can be a great grain marketer without ever touching futures and options yourself personally. Now, when you sell grain to the grain buyer to the ethanol plant, whoever they're going to use the board on your behalf to hedge that position. But I have seen it done so many times. I, I Some of the best grain marketers I know don't ever touch futures and options themselves. Yeah, the, the grain buyer is going to do it on their behalf. Um, I wait, second, I, I, I wait, wait, uh, wait, I was talking. That's the one that I love 
I swear to God, I still don't fully know about puts and calls. And I, I really, those things, those things get me a little confused. Let me ask you this question. You ever talked to a farmer who like paid back his operating line with few, with puts and calls? No. No, they pay back their operating line with cash sales. I mean, that's they pay what, back that's their operating line with, yeah, they, they pay back their, their borrowed, their borrowed money gets paid off with revenue, which is based on selling the property. They're not bad. They, they're, if you're the right person and you understand it and you really want to maximize what you're doing, there's there's a place for them, hundred percent, and and I still do futures and options business for the right people who who understand the concept. But you can do it and do it well without them. Put it that way. Yeah, and I, I think you're really a smart point there. Is let the person at the at the the ethanol facility has a person that that's all they do is stare at a computer yep. screen all day and jack around with futures and options and put and puts and calls and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff in place. You go out and do what you do, right? Go produce a crop and and run your business. Okay, got it. What's the second thing I don't need? I wrote down um, any sort of exotic products, over the counter products, accumulators, managed money, um, different sort of average pricing programs. I mean, they always sound great, but this is one thing that that can work out. They can work out. Managed bushel programs can work out, but you don't need them to be good. Uh, my neighbor used to do accumulators, and I had to have two different times of sitting down with him and drinking and have him explain it to me so that I understood the the thing. Because at certain points you get kicked out, you can't, you don't get let yeah. in. I mean, it's it's there's some complexity to that. The devil's in the details with those because they're they're contracts, they're legal contracts, and they all they're all structured different. So it um, it it depends. There, I mean, I've seen them work out. Don't make any mistake about that. But uh, again, throw that in, in the camp of something that can be useful, but. You can be very good without it. Yeah, I love it. Third thing. Third thing I wrote down was, this is a bunch of things in one, uh, crop conditions, weather, weather forecasts, El Nino, La Nina, and long-term weather forecasts. Um, people pay way too much attention to this stuff. And it's not that it doesn't move the market. It, it does. It's just that when you see the worst weather forecast and you see the worst conditions, that's going to be probably when you should be making your sales and not getting all bulled up and worried about not making sales. Um, so I guess if you use it in the right way, uh, they can be useful, but I see that stuff as being a uh, hugely detrimental. Guess what? Nobody can predict the weather more than five days out. You think somebody's going to look at a long-term multi-year El Nino pattern and predict what the weather's going to do six months from now? There's, there's no way. It just, it doesn't happen. It's, someday, it's, not, it's not helpful to you. Someday, I, uh, maybe it'll be when I'm closer to my retirement, I'm going to launch the speaking tour where it's what I really think. And people are going to be like, Jesus, Damien, you didn't tell us. I'm like, no, I did. But now see, I'm, I'm not even there yet. I'm like, I'm telling you kind of half what I really think. See, and, and, I, and, I, and, I can't so, go. I, I can't go uh, full into that. yet. So <laughs> I'm going to go, uh, Joe, I'm going to go with like, yeah, bare knuckle. You thought I was honest before. And now I'm in your face. And one of them is I've been I made jokes for several years. I get on stage. and I say, oh, I see that uh, you had the weather guy here. Let me go ahead and just uh, give you, if you don't want to spend the money next year on a weather guy, I'll give it to you. Well, it's going to be an El Nino year. It's going to be a little wetter. Though. Now, here's what's probably going to happen. It's going to be dry until it gets really wet. Then we'll think, oh, my yeah. God, we got more moisture than we need. And then we're going to talk about whether we get spring planting done. And you know what? Big part of the Midwest and Corn Belt's going to get really dry in August. There's going to be a little bit of a weather scare. It is the same bullshit Every person, every year, and they put up some colored charts, which is interesting. I'm colorblind. When they start showing orange, red, green, and brown pictures on that. Well, the map, red's when everybody gets really bullish and doesn't sell anything. That's Which is interesting, Joe. I can't even tell the difference. So I don't know if it's yeah. red or green anyhow. So like these people are like, oh my God, this looks horrible. I'm like, don't, uh, don't, don't make this. I don't want to make this sound like I'm bashing weather guys. I pay for weather services, more than one of them, um, because I need to be on top of it, especially the, the near term stuff. What's going to happen next week? What's going to happen maybe 10 days out? What's Your the market point very well to? taken, Joe. You can't, somebody telling you what's going to happen in Brazil in April when right now it's December is right. full of shit. Yes. Okay. Next one. <laughs> uh, I wrote down uh, price predictors slash people with strong opinions. Nobody has a damn clue where the market's going to go. And if there's somebody who uh, is is telling you that they know where the market's going to go, uh, that that person is an amateur. Uh, professionals, when it comes to financial markets, deal uh, more so in probabilities. Um, here's a here's one thing that's probable: a crop scare event when the market rallies on weather is probably a marketing opportunity. Not always a marketing opportunity, but probably most crop scare events are a marketing opportunity. That's a probability that you can deal in. Anybody who deals in certainties hasn't dealt with markets 
or hasn't done it professionally because uh, there are no certainties. I spoke at your home state uh, at a conference uh, several years ago, at least 10 years ago, and there was, as you just called it, a price predictor or mm -hmm. slash comma, I should say, quote mark, expert with strong opinions. And I pulled a farm guy aside after I did my thing, which was mostly funny, a little bit of outlook, and I did the same thing. I'm like, here's where I think things are going. I don't mind if you question that based on the data, whatever. And you know, I did my thing. Then we went and had a beer afterwards. And I said, what do you think about that guy that I followed? He said, well, if he's this convict, if he's this, if he's this cocksure about everything he just told us, why is he talking to us in Springfield, Illinois in January instead of operating from, I said, from his resort that he owns his, his, in, in Bimini? I question exactly what you just said. Um, if, you, if you are this absolute certain, I, I think you're almost getting to where you're a little bit more of a con man. And the, the scary thing about it is that they're going to be right sometimes because there's only two ways that the market can go up or down, right? right. And uh, if you if you are a price predictor and you constantly tell people the market's going to go up, someday you're going to be right. And then people are going to be convinced, uh, at least for a moment in time, that you know something when you don't. And it leads to, that, that sort of thing leads to a lot of bad decisions. I love it. Even a stopped clock is right twice. Absolutely. Day, right? Absolutely. And they're probably right more often than that, which is the, that's the scary thing. Number five thing that I don't need. I didn't number these, so I don't actually know how many there are. Well, I know, um, but you, I, I, I'm numbering them. I'm numbering them. I'm it might be, it I'm might only be notes. I'm like, your, be. You're like, you're like the guest professor that I always wish I had, and I'm writing them down. It may only be like 10. Uh, the next one I wrote down was anybody with a system or uh, cycles or anything along those lines that's like a longer term thing. Like I have a, I have a commodity system that works every year. Um, I have... I have this theory about cycles that we're going to post a cycle high or cycle low uh, at at this week in this month in this year. Um, they just they don't work. I mean, if anybody really had a system for predicting commodity prices that's worked over the course of decades, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know that they'd be selling it to farmers on Facebook. I mean, to be honest with you. Now, there is some reality to cycles. Um, I just was and I'm not a cattle trader. But I was explaining the beef situation to a another University of Illinois graduate friend of mine who's not in on the ag side. And I was simply explaining that the way the cycle works, that we, we start having high prices, then all of a sudden there's less supply because of, you know, heifers don't get bread, they get fed instead and get fattened and butchered. And so those are cycles about supply. You 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 must admit the same thing happens in grains. The same thing yeah. happens in grains. So you must you admit both. there there is a there is a reality, Joe. To there is a truth about the cycle happening in commodities in terms of supply uh, and production. But you're saying don't fall for the gimmick or the expert that's telling you I use the cycle method to sell your stuff. There are cycles, but they can't be predicted. And there's supply and demand cycles. And in in uh, production agriculture, there are boom cycles and there are bust cycles. Like we're just. We were just in a boom cycle, 20, uh, second half of 2020 through uh, first part of 2023, we were, we were in a boom cycle. Prior to that, 2014 through 19, we were in a bust cycle. And now we may, may be entering a bust cycle. I don't know. I don't know that for sure. So yeah, it, it, it absolutely is cyclical, same as it's ever been, but it's it's not, these are not cycles that can be predicted. Got it. Uh, so uh, I don't need to pay somebody that's telling me about their cycle or system method. Of these are all my opinions, Ian. These are not facts. These are these are my opinions. Uh, I had you on here because I think I didn't. I just open the show by saying you're a man with forceful convictions. But you know what? People would say that about me. I openly admit that I could be wrong, but I give the data or the reason, and so do you. Here's why I don't think this, or here's why when I talk about where I see things going on yeah. the future of agriculture, I'm like, here's why I think this, and this data is absolutely irrefutable. It's, it's real. It's data, but the outcome could be different than I'm predicting. So I, I, I agree with what you're doing here. Okay, here's the next one. Uh, theories, the crazy theories. The USDA says that the corn yields 173, and that's bullshit because they're trying to keep the prices down. I mean, get out of here. We've been, we've had, you were able to sell corn at $7 for like three years straight. Like where was the, where was the manipulation then? I mean, we get, we get more comments about this topic uh, in return to our, our social media stuff, our public stuff and our paid stuff than anything. 
It's the government's out to screw us. The USDA is out to screw us. Everybody's out to screw us. But at the same time, they're subsidizing crop insurance. At the same time, they're doing uh, COVID assistance payments and all this stuff. Just guys, th that's just the nature of it. We ended up with big crops this year because the, the rains fell in a timely manner. And that's not something everybody wants to hear, but there is no nobody that's out to get you. This is you versus you. It's all it when is. the crop report comes out or the USDA, WASD, all that kind of stuff comes out, just for the fun of it, and it, it, it could be all time consuming, spend 20 minutes scrolling through Twitter. If your Twitter feed is like mine, you have uh, mostly ag people in it. I would say one uh, in three of the commenters or posts are about the idea that uh, USDA is doing it again, screwing yeah. the farmer, putting yeah. it out there. Hey, speaking of uh, screwing but the farmer. But people think it's real. People absolutely think it's real. 100%. Oh, yeah, yeah, A yeah. A lot of people. Yeah. A I mean, lot of they, people. They, they, well, the USDA is doing this to keep prices low, so that yeah. way there's no so there's no food panic. And yeah. there's a side of me, because I generally, uh, you know, I think the government has does things wrong most of the time, but I don't think USDA does. So I I... I appreciate you saying this. Sometimes I have bought into the idea that there could be a reason that they're putting numbers out that don't seem what realistic. Okay. Most farmers can't tell you a week before harvest what their yields are going to be on their own farm. You think USDA is going to be able to nail it within half a bushel nationally in August? It just doesn't I love, happen. They're, I love they're, not right all, they're not right all the time. I love that point. You know, even my farm guys and that I know said, yeah, we went out and scouted the fields, uh, but we didn't see this coming. Like all yeah. of a sudden they had a big surprise on the upside in Northeast Indiana where they're getting like 40 bushels more per acre. So yeah, I agree with what you're saying right there. You know, you what? don't want USDA's job. You don't want to have to do that. I would like the benefits though. I mean, let's face it. I mean, government benefits, sure. Take yeah, it. you get retire early. You don't really have to work that hard. All right. Speaking of working hard, um, are you working smart on your farm? If you are, you are looking for ways to make revenue other than just doing the hard work you do. What about Truterra? My friends over at Truterra can help you in your regenerative journey. Basically, you can get paid money for doing stuff you maybe already are doing, reducing your tillage, uh, putting out some cover crops, and maybe it's time to experiment with that. Guess what? You can do it. You can probably find, find some government program that'll pay you for doing this. And also, you can pick up some money from Truterra. TruterraAg.com is where you can go and enroll. You, it doesn't cost nothing. You can go on their website and you can fill out their application. All of a sudden, it's called like a soil health survey. Truterra Ag might be able to, I mean, you can trust them. They're part of Lando Lakes. You know, they've been around for a couple of days. Anyway, go and check out TruterraAg.com and see if maybe they can help you in your regenerative journey and make dollars on acres doing stuff you're already doing. Don't cost nothing helps you out. Truterra Ag. Okay. Um, that was a big one right there. Theories that the USDA is manipulating the market. It's We hear more about it than anything. Than <laughs> anything. Bar none. Maybe, maybe it's just the last year. It probably is just the last year, but that's my recent recollection. Number seven thing that I don't need social media oh, and, and I am like I am a damn like poster boy for ag social media I mean yeah I'm, I'm one of them for sure yeah. and most of it's poison I mean you go and you look you scroll through Twitter and it's everything is sensationalized everybody's got some smart ass comment everyone's got some crazy weather map with a lot of red on it um everyone's got a yield report that is an outlier from every other yield report to support their opinion of the marketplace. I just took a picture of um, us that I'm going to put on social media after this uh, episode. But you were looking; you were, your eyes were closed. You're going to look. I'm, right the, I'm like, the first. I'm the first to admit it, and I probably do more. I don't do. I don't do Twitter, but I do YouTube and uh, and podcasts, and that's I guess social. I think that's considered social media. I don't really socialize with anybody on social media, but um, in any case, like it's it's terrible and it it sways opinions it absolutely does and it results in bad decisions it's very powerful it does sway opinions i have i i dream of the day when i don't have to be out there as a personality um yeah. but it is oh god i can't wait I've t i tell people all the time i said when i'm done with this stupid content business i'm i'm getting a flip phone i'm throwing my computers in the lake like i'm done like no one you're never going to hear from me ever again see you later Bro, you Peace know out. what i said i was even going one further i said a landline like uh, when i'm at my farm oh yeah my buddies know they can pull in anytime after about five and there's three beers on tap and we're going to play with the dogs, take a golf cart ride and have a cigar. Yeah. I don't even need a damn flip phone. I'm going to someday because there's also a poisonous side of it. I used to call it toxic Twitter. I used to have people want to fight with me, even people in the industry. Twitter used to be. Nothing. Twitter used to be. Real farmer. Ten, yeah. ten years ago, Twitter was actually not bad. There was some decent stuff and people on there and now it's, it's toxic. 
It is toxic. And yes, and I've, I've, had, I've had, well, the word is attack, which I thought it funny, the media has, and social media. Attack is what happened when the Japanese killed 2,000 guys at Pearl Harbor and uh, destroyed our, our board. Yeah. Um, typing in capital letters on Twitter is hardly what I'd call an attack, but I have been uh, maligned and mistreated by even people with thin egg. Like I said, you, you're you not a real farmer. What in the hell? You don't know nothing. I'm like, okay, you're right. The problem uh, is uh, with a lot of it is lack of context. You can't you can't convey context or sarcasm or tone through 140 characters. I know they've expanded it, but you get the point, you know. In, in real life, which I've never met you in real life, it's only been online, you have no problem conveying sarcasm or, or cynicism. Me? Or oh, cynicism. No. Or or a degree of cynicism. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know, I guess. It comes, <laughs> with, comes with age. I'm not that old yet, but I'm getting there. I had somebody tell me when I was my first year in comedy, second year maybe, he was an agent, and he said, Damien, I'm worried that a few years in this in the show business, you might become cynical and jaded. And I said, that's your concern? I said, buddy, I'm already there. So Yeah, uh, I, I feel you. <laughs> Number eight, what do I do? Uh, re-ownership. You know what re-ownership is? No. It's when, um, it's when a farmer sells corn or soybeans in, in the cash market. And then and buys it back on paper? They buy it back on paper. So the the object of the game is very simple. You grow a crop, you sell it at a profit, and then you move on to the next year. Re-ownership, what it does, first off, it, it's a terrible practice from a mental standpoint um, because like you're you're looking back on previous like business decisions. It's like how many how many damn decisions do you want to juggle at at the same time? You're already like right now. So if you sell 2023 20, bushels, and and I'm not recommending that you do anything of any sorts. But you go sell bushels and then you decide you're going to reown it on the board. So now you're juggling two crop years worth of stuff. You're juggling 23 stuff you sold, but but now you reown. But then you got to look at 24. Like make your sale and be done. Make your sale and be done. If you if you participated in reownership every year, you're I don't know that it's going to work out for you over the long term. There are situations, of course, where it works out, but just this practice of like taking these old business decisions and trying to like reestablish and what other business does that? What other business makes a sale at at a profit and then decides that they're going to go back and try to make it better or screw it up? Yeah. That, by the way, I, this is one that uh, again I, I don't trade, but I I have had farmers tell me that they do this. Well, I went ahead and sold, but then I bought it back on paper, and I thought, yeah, so then you really cheap. didn't sell it. You did. You didn't. Well, I bought the right to do it, and I paid this and this, mm-hmm. and I'm kind of with you. I'm like, why don't I just like you said, make the sale? It's profitable. And unless it's unless it's something that I'm not understanding, it seems like you made the sale, but you didn't really make the sale because you bought it back on paper. So I'm like, I'm not sure I, I comprehend it. First off, that's not even possible. I went to the car dealership and I bought a car, but then I sold it back to him. Then I bought it on paper. I'm like, Bill, what the hell are you talking about? It doesn't yeah. even. It it doesn't seem. It doesn't. It's not like so it, it seems unnecessary. The one thing that has changed, and this is this is the argument that I'll get on this is Joe. The interest rates are high. And um, I I don't want to sell right now, but I have to because I don't want to pay interest. I want to go pay back my operating line. I can I can understand that. I can I get it. I can understand it. I can see a situation where maybe this would be deemed necessary. But just as as a practice in general, over the course of time, if you avoided it, I think you'd be better off. I again, you talk about removing complexity. When this was explained to me, again, this was a three drink explanation because I'm yeah. like, wait a minute, I gave that beer and I'm not sure I still understand it. And yeah. you bought, you sold and you bought it back on paper. So that means, you, did you ever really sell it? And I, I mm. by the way, you're just paying, you're paying for the idea of an upside, right? You're paying, you're, but you're paying. always long. If you're a farmer. You're long, whatever you didn't sell for this year, you're long all of next year, probably, or most of it. You're long 25, you're long 26, you're long 27. I mean, you're always long. Like yep. sell it and sell it and be done. <laughs> Come on. All right. Number nine thing that I don't need. This is the last thing. So I guess I only had nine because I, I grouped a couple of them together. Um, sure. The, the last one I wrote down was trading, which is kind of along the lines of reownership. But a lot of guys trade the markets because it's fun or it's they they want to speculate or they have an opinion. Ninety nine percent of of the uh, U.S. population has no business ever trading a futures or options contract unless they've got a physical position that needs to be hedged. Um, first of all, it's stressful. You guys are stressed out enough. You got enough stress. You don't need to add more stress. Second off, the odds of you making money trading futures over the course of time is not very good. Most people who trade, especially smaller traders, lose money. That's that's the fact of the matter. You would be so much better off 
taking any extra cash that you have and either reinvesting into the business, build working capital, invest in some sort of off the farm investment, buy an S&P 500 index fund and sit on it till you die. I mean, something along those lines, trying to speculate in these markets is it's an additional stressor. It's not going to work for you financially over the course of time with a few exceptions. Like I said, it's it's 98 or 99%. There's 1% out there that can probably do it, but it's not it's not necessary. It's not healthy. It's bad for your mental health. It's bad for your financial health. I I think that's also brilliant because it's kind of like the same person that is in ag that probably doesn't understand, uh, what was it, the meme stock, day mm-hmm. traders, um, millennials, Gen Z kids sitting in their parents' basement uh, trading AMC or whatever the hell it was, uh, you know, Robin Hood, all this. Yeah. They were like, I don't even make any sense. These kids are... But then they themselves would say, would be tempted to say, man, I tell you what, way, way these markets have rallied, I am, I should have taken a position. They Because they're in ag, they think they understand trading. Come no, on. you're probably worse off if you're involved in it, honestly. Like, you, you'd probably be better off knowing nothing about it. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you you, you, you just, just kind of like the kids that were trading, yeah. uh, you know, meme stocks. I don't trade commodities. I don't. I haven't for years. I don't, I don't trade commodities myself. I know better. All right. I like it. So, uh, we got nine things that you do not need. And that's it. I thought the list was long, but I, I combined a couple of them. So, that's... that's I like it. Nine, eight. Nine's easier. There's to probably... Get- there, you know what? There's probably more. I just... That's what I wrote down in five minutes. I wrote, I'm appreciate. this is one of the, you're one of the, one of the most prepared guests I've had in months uh, where you actually wrote, wrote down notes before you came on here. So I appreciate that. And I agree with everything you said. I, I wondered about the re-ownership. I'm glad you got into that. And then the one that I would ask is, do I need an expert? Uh, I'm a farmer. I farm 4,000 acres in Indiana, let's just say. Um, I've got all this, you know, product. I had a couple hundred bushels of corn off of every acre I farm. You know, seventy bushels of soybeans off of every acre I farm. I got a lot of stuff to sell. Do you I need do my own? Do I sell it on my own? Do I do I trust my gut? And like you said, the three things I do need to know: I make sure I have good crop insurance. I know what my cost of production is. And then do I just go to the Montpelier, you know, Central Grain and say, you know what, I'm going to take you up on that offer. You're 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 going to give me so much here uh, to deliver in. October, I'll take the deal. Is that all I need to do or do I need an expert advice? I don't know if you need an expert and I don't want to try to sell anything here. There are a lot of people in the business that are good, that have your best interest in mind. There absolutely are. What you, what you need to do is have something like, um, something that would resemble like a board of directors, like a grain marketing board of directors. You need three or four people you can bounce ideas off of. I've had, I've had subscribers uh, who, who do my paid deal come back and say, Joe, you're like kind of on my board of directors because we call you before we make big decisions, right? So I, and it doesn't have to be me. It can be anybody, but I think you need like, you need to, to, to circle the decisions with three or four people. You need to run them by three or four people that, that are maybe not in your family or maybe not in your farm that are maybe outside of the farm that can try to make sense of this st- stuff for you and, and simplify it for you ideally. Do you think, because it's my opinion, when there's stuff about investing, I've lost money on investments. God knows the longer you live and the more money you, uh, you know, come through your hands, the more you're going to have a chance to make some bad investments. Mm-hmm. You see farm guys that make, farm gals too, farm people that make bad decisions. And I wonder if it's because they're overwhelmed with this list of nine things that you just gave Absolutely me. they are. They're absolutely overwhelmed. And guess what? Everybody's going to make a bad decision every year, a hundred times when it comes to markets and marketing. The way that a lot of people see it is like, if I sold a bushel that wasn't at the dead high, that was a bad decision. So by definition, by the def- by the definition, how a lot of people define good grain marketing, you are going to make, most of your decisions are going to be bad because if you didn't sell the high, that's a bad decision, right? So um, you got to kind of get over that. Like you're going to, you're not going to sell the high. Um, if it, yeah. if it makes money, if it, if it, if it lines up with your margin targets and what you feel like uh, the, the farm should be doing financially, then it's a good decision. You're not going to sell the highest. So don't even try. I, I love it because whether it's personal, you know, my book back here, uh, which by the way, our buddy Chris Barron's a big fan of the business, do business better book. I open by saying, listen, you know, I don't have a Harvard MBA, which is probably good. I keep things very simple and uh, it seems to work because the, the opposite symbol is complex, which most people can't handle that. And then it becomes overwhelming. And that's essentially what we just talked about. What you talked about here was you made it simple by getting rid of the overwhelming and generally unnecessary, right? 
This is uh, one of the this is one of the things you emailed me. You said, Joe, who benefits from making grain marketing simpler? And the answer is nobody aside from the farmer. Yeah, right, right. So, because who benefits by making it more complex? Everybody that's in the middle getting a piece uh, or a payment off of making putting in the complexities, right? And I'll get I'll get accused here of of Joe, you sell shit to farmers. Yeah, I do, but I set it up. I guess what I have to live. I I set it up in a way that I thought was the best way possible. I charge people fifty dollars a month to get my info, and that's it. You want what I send out? You want to know what's on my mind? That's it. And that that's all it is. I don't do transaction stuff. I don't do per bushel stuff. I don't do per acre stuff. I've I've tried to make a business where, yeah, I can make money and, and stay in business, but make it reasonable and and something that is is not complicated. Put it that way. I like it. And I think I know I know people are gonna come back right right away and say, Well, this guy oh, yeah, is selling, yeah. this guy's selling stuff too. Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. The guy Sorry. the the the, the, the the know-it-all dumbass on Twitter is saying, "Well, it's this guy talking about? He's underselling stuff. You sell, you sell information. You sell information, and I do. And you don't, uh, you you don't tell people. I'm going to help you with re ownership. I'm going to be your uh, day trader. Um, I, uh, yeah, all these things. And I'm also going to not let you get away with telling me that the United States Department of Agriculture purposefully manipulated the market prediction down, uh, manipulated the yield data down. I like, I like your stuff. Well, no one's ever going to believe you. So, I mean, I can say that till I'm blue in the face and people will still argue with me, but it's just, it's just how it is. Just how it is. That That's going to be a constant forever till, till the day I'm dead. People will complain about the government, you know? Well, I complain about the government also. Yeah. I, hey, I get it. Uh, three things you need as a producer. You need to know what your cost of production is. You need to understand and work with and utilize crop insurance. You need yep. to use hedge to arrive, cash sales. The nine things you do not need. You do not need uh, to be using futures and options. There are there's a place for that. That would be the the local trader that's over there making sure the supply. Or if you're or if you're more if if you're a little bit more advanced, you've done it before. You you totally understand the complexities. Knock yourself out. I like I said, I still do futures and options business for the right people. Yeah, well, again, and you said the ethanol plant should use them absolutely, but the average producer probably doesn't necessarily. Especially if you're if, if you're a beginner, this is your first or second year marketing grain. That that's not the place to start. Put it that Number way. Number two thing you don't need: exotic products, accumulators, all these different odd oddball contracts that become again. It's introduction. It's introducing complexity into your mm-hmm. grain marketing that's unnecessary. Number three thing you don't need: crop condition reports, over and over done, weather forecasting, weather experts. People are going to tell you what El Nino does for the uh, the 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 step A part of uh, Middle of Central Asia. It doesn't matter. But again, I I pay for weather services. I do, but for the short term stuff. Yeah, exactly. Nobody knows what's going to happen in six months from now. No. Uh, price predictors and experts with strong opinions. If these people actually knew what the hell they were talking about, they should be on their yacht in Bimini right now uh, versus a, at the at the conference where they're speaking for free in Springfield trying to pick up clients. The I, reality of it is the reality of that is that nobody knows. And the people who get rich in financial markets are good risk managers. They get stuff wrong, too. Always. Yeah. It's it's a matter of managing for the downside and, yes. and capitalizing exactly. on the upside. Exactly which is obviously what you're all about. Number five thing, I don't need a system or a cycle. When I have somebody that's selling me on their cycle uh, predictor or their- There's no magic formula. It just does not exist. Theories that the USDA, we already covered. <laughs> uh, social media, be careful there. While we all, you know, we, we, let's face it, these guys, their combine steers itself, their tractor steers itself. They got to do something. So I get on their Twitter feed and then they start uh, they start uh, getting going down. To, there is a toxicity to social media. Be careful, even though, and Joe and I, in full disclosure, we're out there. I put something up every freaking day because I have to, uh, because it's my job. So, and Joe and I are both going to be reachable by a landline. Uh, when I cook out, when I'm old, I'm not going to do any social media. I'm not going to have my computer. I'm going to make sauerkraut, walk with my dogs. Basically, it's going to be very similar to today. Get the uh, rotary phone, the one that has, you have to spin the the numbers to dial. That's We used to have my grandma's house. That's, that's what you need. You, if you're not your age or older, you don't even know what a rotary phone is. You, you, uh, yeah, I'm probably, probably one of the last ones, yeah. Re-ownership. So glad you brought this up. The number eight thing that you don't need. Re-ownership. Uh, just make the sale and be done is what Joe Vaklovic says. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, and then being a day trader and speculating, you know, there's people that this is what they do, and it's a very, very small handful of people. And your yeah. point was, if you are a producer, if you are out here, even if you're in a professional in agriculture, unless you're a professional in trading, yeah. it's probably something that's going to harm you more than hurt you or help you. Over the years, yeah. You may have a good year, but that's it's been my experience. I've done a lot of brokerage business. Uh, most people don't make money over the course of years. 
The man's name is Joe Vaklovic, and uh, he's got he's got great content, and he's awesome, and I'm so glad he came on the business of agriculture. His company's called Standard Grain. If you want to pay the 50 bucks and get straight talk and honest information from this guy, how do they go about doing it, Joe? I won't even tell you to go do that. You should you should watch my YouTube videos. We do a, we do a new YouTube video every single morning. It goes up at 6 a.m. Central Time. We talk about the markets. If you like the way that I talk and think about the markets, then consider the premium deal. It's totally free to start. Just, just I'm going at, to go over watching. and subscribe. I'm going to, as soon as I get done with this, I'm going to go over and subscribe to his YouTube channel. And um, uh, I, I recommend that uh, you do the same because he's got great stuff. I'm grateful again that you came on here. Um, and I appreciate your preparation for doing this. Anything? Thanks else, for having me. Anything else you want to leave the my viewers and listeners with? No, I, people are going to give us some shit about this, but it's all right. <laughs> you got to have thick skin to be, you got to, hey, be in, put your face out there and, and talk and, and demonstrate an opinion that's not popular. I mean, better have thick skin, you know? I've had people that uh, ridicule me. I've had people that, that uh, tell me I'm not, I don't really know anything because I'm not a real farmer. I've had the whole thing. I even had one guy that, uh, in, uh, some guy in the uh, oddball poultry arrangement that uh, challenged, he wanted to fight me. So, uh, yeah. you know what? Good thing Joe and I work out. We can take, we can handle ourselves. Anyway, his name is Joe Vakovic. My name is Damian Mason. Thanks for being here. Share this with somebody that can benefit from it. As usual, this is the Business of Agriculture. Well, that concludes another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. This episode was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You know, everybody in agriculture understands the importance of soil health. We also keep an eye on our soil better than we ever did through advanced soil testing. But what if there was a company that provided predictive analytics? Not just checking out nutrients and all the elements that are in there, but also could tell you the degree of risk you face with disease and pest pressure. That's right. Pattern Ag can do that. They actually can tell you, hey, you're going to have a real issue here. You can preemptively, proactively treat for corn rootworm or cyst nematode or sudden death syndrome before the problem actually starts costing you yield. Go to pattern.ag, that's www.pattern.ag to find the nearest rep that can help you start doing better for your soil.